All right, good afternoon and welcome everybody to this meeting of the Boston Region Metropolitan Planning Organization's Transit Working Group. My name is Sandy Johnston and I am a Senior Transportation Planner with the staff of the MPO. I will be uh, your host this afternoon. Um, so I'm just going to run through a couple of items at the beginning and uh, then I'm going to uh, turn it over to Tegan Teich to introduce uh, the event. So, so if we could go to the next slide, please. Actually, uh, two slides out of the accessibility statement, please. All right, so this meeting is accessible to people with disabilities. Zoom products are compliant with exceptions with the following standards, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.1 Level AA Standards and Revised Section 508 Standards. If you require any additional accommodations in order to participate fully in this meeting, please contact uh, my co-host, Stella Jordan uh, of MPO staff at S. J O R D A N at ctps.org or 857 702 3675. And uh, with that, uh, I would like to turn things over to Tegan Tai, the Executive Director of the Boston Region MPO, to uh, introduce everybody. Thanks, Sandy, and welcome, everyone. I was able to do a quick skim through the participant list and certainly see a number of familiar faces. Um, so welcome to you all for this next meeting, this meeting of the Transit Working Group. Um, as Sandy said, it's hosted by us, the Boston Region MPO, and I'm the Executive Director of the staff to the Boston Region MPO. And um, as some um, folks may already be familiar with, but in case there's anyone new, I do like to say just a couple of things at the beginning, um, just about what we do as an MPO. And again, while I do, please do take a moment in the chat to um, introduce yourselves to each other. Feel free to do it while I'm talking. I will not be offended at all and share your name, your affiliation, and um, where you or your transit service is located. So um, about the MPO, we, um, the MPO board um, approves the allocation of federal transportation dollars in the Boston region, which is 97 cities and towns. Um, the board, the decision-making, the policy board includes representatives from the MBTA um, and also includes representatives from um, municipalities and other groups that engage um, regional transit providers. And as staff to the Boston Region MPO, we provide both planning and technical work in support of reaching the region's goals um, of a sustainable, healthy, equitable, robust, and economic, economically viable transportation system, of which, of course, um, transit is a core, core, core component. So if you want to learn more about the MPO, please visit our Frequently Asked Questions page on our website, and that link should go in the chat if it hasn't already. Um, <clears throat> And then I just wanted to say that um, one of the things we do um, as staff of the MPO is work with our many partners to convene forums to really have conversations about crucial transportation topics like we are doing today. And so this particular forum is one that we host to um, really facilitate the coordination between transit providers and to build connections between transit providers and, and all of you at this meeting um, with the MPO as well. So, <clears throat> There, sorry, I have a, I think allergies are going a little bit crazy right now for everyone. Um, so more information about this working group is also on the MPO website, and we'll share a link to that as well in the chat. And then finally for today, I just want to say, as always, I'm excited for the discussion. Um, I'll be listening in for the rest of the discussion myself, and I wanted to thank our guest speakers, um, Susan Barrett and Elizabeth Tibbetts-Nutt and Ellie McCarthy. Um, as well as the many MPO staff you'll see on this meeting who will be contributing um, to the content today. So Sandy Johnston, also many thanks to you um, for being the facilitator of these meetings. And um, I'll leave it to you to say more about why we are here today and what we'll discuss. So Sandy, please take it back. All right, thank you for the introduction, Tegan. Uh, so for those who have come in since I introduced myself for the first time, my name is Sandy Johnston. I'm a senior transportation planner with the staff to the MPO, uh, where, among other hats I wear, I manage this transit working group. Uh, so as, as Tegan mentioned, looking at the chat and the participants list, looks like we have a great mix of folks here today, representatives from transit agencies, other transit operators, municipalities, variety of other sectors. I really appreciate everyone being here today, whether you've previ previously attended working group meetings or if this is your first time. Um, I do want to remind folks the meeting is being recorded and the recording as well as the slides and other materials will be made available on uh, the MPO website and on our YouTube channel later. Um, so Stella, if we could go to the next slide, please. Just gonna go over some quick meeting guidelines. Uh, as I mentioned before, Stella Jordan will be co-hosting the meeting with me. Uh, 
my, you may have noticed that you joined the meeting on mute. Please do not unmute yourself unless we call on you. Uh, we will de clearly designate times for comment and questions, and you can always comment in the chat, but you can unmute yourself. If you haven't already, please rename yourself with your first and last name, uh, a comma, and then your affiliation. We do encourage you to use the chat box again. To participate in the discussion, please select the raise hand function. Find this by clicking either on the participants button at the bottom of the screen and a window will pop up with a raise hand button at the bottom or the reactions button in the toolbar. We'll then call on you. And I know that, that the uh, where you find that function can vary depending on your version of Zoom. If you run into any technical difficulties during the meeting, you can send a message through the chat and one of us will contact connect with you. You can also reach Stella at S-J-O-R-D-A-N at ctps.org or 857-702-3675. Uh, if you would need or would like closed captioning, you can turn it on under live captioning in the control menu at the bottom of the page. You may need to click on the three dots that say more. And again, you can also reach out to us if uh, you would like us to turn that on for you. You'll see many of those instructions and contact information repeated on the slide uh, that's on the screen right now. Uh, some other details. In general, we will be prioritizing comments and questions from transit providers during most portions of the meetings, uh, meeting, although we will try to get to everybody as time allows. We do have some time reserved for general public comment toward the end of the meeting. The chat will be open and we'll periodically check it. You may see links mentioned in the various presentations. Uh, we will drop them in the chat as much as we are able, uh, and we will also round them up and include them in a post-meeting email. Uh, and as I said before, the meeting is being recorded. Video will be available on our YouTube channel. Uh, and there will be where there are also previous uh, meetings recordings and uh, the slides will be available on our meeting calendar as well. And that will also go up by email. Uh, any logistical questions at this point? All right, so, so if we could go to the next slide, please. What we have here on the slide is just a brief rundown of today's agenda, which is also available in a, at a link that I am going to put in the chat. So there you go. Um, first, we'll have a quick variety of updates on MPO related matters that might be of interest to the group. Uh, there will be an opportunity for transit providers to bring up what you're working on and think others should know about or what uh, you'd like to know. Uh, I am going to lead a quick discussion to get your opinions as a group on how to run meetings such as this one in the future. And then we have two guest presentations that I'm very excited about. Uh, the first is from the town of Lexington and their partners in the 128 Business Council. And they'll discuss a research and planning project that they're undertaking to look at opportunities for regionalized transit service that can fill gaps in the larger network. The second from Ellie McCarthy of the MassDOT Rail and Transit Division follows up on her presentation from our October 2021 meeting and showcases innovative and interesting grant funded projects at regional transit authorities around the Commonwealth. Finally, there will be some time for general public comments and then some information about how will we, be, we will be following up after the meeting. All right, next slide, please. So now that we're done with the preliminaries, let's jump right into the updates we have from MPO staff. Uh, we have quick updates on a couple different items. Since we're a little bit time constrained today, uh, I know there might be questions, but I would like to encourage you to follow up with my colleagues offline if you have any questions uh, and they will, they will leave their contact information in the chat after they talk. So uh, first I would like to introduce, introduce uh, my colleague Matt Genova, our Transportation Improvement Program Manager, to give a little bit of an update on the MPO's capital program. Awesome, thanks Sandy and good afternoon everyone. Uh, again, my name is Matt Genova. I manage the MPO's TIP or Transportation Improvement Program, uh, which again, as Sandy mentioned, is the five-year capital plan for transportation projects here in the Boston region. Uh, and those transportation projects are ones that are funded using federal dollars and so, the TIP process is really sort of where the rubber meets the road for the MPO's work. So we actually allocate those federal transportation dollars to specific transportation projects here in the region. Um, and I know many of you on the call today have projects that are either funded in the current TIP or in past TIPs. Um, so you're probably well familiar with this process. Um, but for those who um, you know, want sort of a, a little more background here, um, the TIP process for this year just wrapped up last week actually. So the MPO board endorsed the federal fiscal years 2023 through 27 tip back on last Thursday, May 26th. Uh, and so that tip is the one that will go into effect uh, for the five years beginning October 1st of this year of 2022. Um, and so I just wanted to, uh, since we're winding down 
this year's TIP process and looking ahead to next year's already. Uh, I wanted to just sort of provide a, a couple of updates on, on where things landed for this year and also a couple of forward looking notes. Um, so this year's final TIP, again, that 23 through 27 TIP, um, includes increased funding from across the board for all agencies. Uh, and again, these are federal funds. And so as many of you are probably familiar, the bipartisan infrastructure law was passed back in November. And so um, through that law, um, agencies, including us here at the MPO, but also MassDOT, the META, uh, Metro West RTA, and Cape Ann RTA are all seeing um, varying ranges of, of funding increases through that new bipartisan infrastructure law. So if you're reviewing the new tip, uh, you'll certainly see that throughout. Um, some things I wanted to flag specifically about MPO investments. Um, so the MPO has a first and last mile funding program, which we've talked to this group about in the past. It's called our Community Connections Program. Through that program, we funded uh, in this funding round, uh, six new shuttle and micro transit projects. Again, some of the agencies um, sponsoring those projects are, are here on the call today. Uh, so thank you all for applying to that program and for you know, advancing your projects through the, the MPO process. Um, and we also uh, worked with the MBTA this year to fund um, two station modernization projects through the MPO's transit modernization program. And so both the community connections and the transit modernization programs are ongoing programs uh, that the MPO has um, that fund um, sort of first and last mile and also transit projects. Um, so part of this talk here today is just to make you aware that those programs do exist and that the MPO does have funding opportunities available um, for um, transit, both transit service and other sorts of uh, transit capital projects. Um, and because of that increase in funding that I talked about a little bit earlier through the new bipartisan infrastructure law, um, the MPO actually made the decision in this year's TIP to increase the year-over-year -year funding amounts for both of those programs going forward. And so the forward-looking note that I want to um, close here with today is really um, for those agencies here in the region um, that are considering projects in the future, um, they could be shuttle or microtransit projects, um, you know, station or other asset modernization projects, um, you know, please come talk to us about, about your ideas. We definitely want to hear them as we look forward to our next funding round. Um, the, the TIP process for next year won't get started in earnest until September or October um, with project um, proposals due by December. But uh, at this stage, this is a great opportunity for you all. Uh, if you do have questions about either of these programs or how to get your transit projects funded by the MPO, um, this is a good time to go ahead and start those conversations with us so that we can give you some guidance on how to apply. Um, especially with those increased funding levels, we anticipate being able to fund more of these projects in the coming years. Um, so please do get in touch. Uh, and again, as Sandy said, I'll share my uh, email in the chat after this. So please don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions on either program. And that's all I have. So thank you all for your time. All right, thank you, Matt. Uh, next, I would like to uh, introduce Shrilika Murthy, who is our program manager for the Unified Planning Work Program, or UPWP, which determines uh, what studies and planning work the MPO is going to be doing. Uh, so Shrilika, would you like to uh, take it away? Sure. Thank you, Sandy. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me today. So like Sandy said, I'm the Unified Planning Work Program Manager. Um, UPWP, as some of you may know, is a one-year budget and planning document that lists uh, research projects, technical assistance, um, and discrete studies that the MPO will undertake over the next federal fiscal year. Um, so at this point, in, at the end of May, we are working on developing the universe of proposed studies, which is the list of discrete studies, that's one year studies, that the MPO will be, that NPO staff will be taking on um, over the next federal fiscal year. Um, as some of you may know, if you've participated in our public process, we um, asked for input from partner agencies, from members of the public, as well as staff, uh, and we received about 76 uh study ideas and proposals and from that we've narrowed it down to about 12 studies that are in the final not final but are that are in the universe that we are currently in discussion with the upwp committee as well as staff to uh, get some feedback on scope and relevance um and at this point the universe is not posted uh, as it is in draft format but uh, we do welcome your feedback um, and we also uh, so you can go to the next slide we do also have our development schedule posted on our website which i'll drop the link in the chat shortly um, there you can see that we are aiming to have a draft upwp in front of the mpo board at their july meeting 
Um, so if you have any questions, if you'd like to chat with me about the process or which studies were selected, I am more than happy to answer any questions or concerns. Um, I will also drop my email in the chat as well. And I look forward to speaking with you. Thank you. All right, thank you, Sri Laika. So let's move right along to transit provider items. This item is just creating space in our agenda for transit providers and transportation agencies to make any announcements that you'd like to share with the group beyond the main topics of today's meeting. Uh, if you do have anything you'd like to share, please raise your hand and we'll call on you or uh, put it in the chat. So I'll just be quiet for a minute and if folks would like to, uh, would like to uh, announce something, please do raise your hand. All right, we'll not see anything. There will also be opportunity for public comment later on in the meeting. And you are also always welcome to reach out to me personally at sjohnston, S-J-O-H-N-S-T-O-N at ctps.org if you have anything you would like shared with the group. Uh, Stella, can we go to the next slide, please? All right, so many of us have already returned to in-person work. For others, a return is uh, still percolating we wanted to kind of take your temperature about how to run these meetings in the future, because I know I've gotten questions about that. We've done some surveys on these questions in the past um, with really inconclusive results. So now I wanna try something new, which is a Zoom poll. Uh, please be patient with us. This is the first time we've done a poll in a meeting like this, um, but we are going to try and address the two questions that are on the screen. Uh, should meetings return to in-person with a hybrid element? for this transit working group, if and, which, if and when it is deemed safe, and what time of day is best for meetings to start. Um, and uh, we will take the results of this poll into consideration in our future planning. So Stella, could you please activate the poll? Um, it says I am logged in from another device, so I can't actually activate the poll. Is anyone else on the computer? Uh, let me see, I shouldn't. Let's see, I got it. Sorry about that. All right. So you should uh, I, you should have the poll launched there for you. Uh, can everybody, anybody see that? Great, okay. All right, so I'll just wait another couple minutes for folks to fill that out. All right, so I think we've, uh, looks like most people have participated and I assume you can see the outcomes. It looks like uh, we're kind of all over the place in terms of uh, the first question, should meetings return to in-person with a hybrid element if and when it's deemed safe? 30% say yes, 15% say no, 36% uh, say sometimes, and 18% have no opinion. So we'll have to process that a little bit. Uh, and then in terms of what time of day is best for folks, 27% say 9 a.m. to noon, 42% say early afternoon. Uh, okay, so we've got a strong plurality there for about this time, although we might have a, a biased response given that it is this time now. Uh, and then only 9% say late afternoon and 21% uh, have no opinion. All right, thank you for the input. We are going to uh, process that and continue thinking about these questions. And I look forward to uh, at least having, I think, some in-person events uh, at some point in the future. I'm going to end the poll now. And uh, thank you again, everybody, for participating in that. All right, just sharing the results briefly. You can look at them. Great. All right, so let's move on to our first guest speaker, our speakers, really. And I'm very excited about this presentation. I'd like to welcome Susan Barrett, the transportation manager for the town of Lexington and a longtime transit working group participant, uh, and Elizabeth Tibbet Snutt, who is the manager of communications, research, and education at the 128 Business Council. They'll be giving us an update on a regionalization action plan they're working on for their part of the Boston region to enhance uh, transit services in areas that are not served or not served well by fixed route transit. 
been, uh, we have heard about this project in the past. I'm very excited about the work and I hope that we'll provide some important lessons for all of us. We'll have about 20 minutes for the presentation followed by 10 minutes for Q&A. So please, Susan and uh, Elizabeth, take it away. Hi, thank you. Um, so I was going to give a little bit of background as to how this project came to be. And I think um, uh, some from the MBO will advance the slides as to what the goals of the project were. Um, thank you. Um, so you can see what the ultimate goal of the project was uh, when we had applied for this grant to um, from the Community Transit Grant Program of MassDOT. We wanted to create an actionable framework to move communities in our area towards regionalization um, so that we had better connectivity and use of resources essentially for everyone. Um, and we wanted a more to create a more coordinated system to reduce the problem of uncoordinated services, which you see in this picture. Apologies that I, I'm not exactly sure where this image came from. I believe it was from an MAPC report many, many years ago. But I do like this image because I think it really sums up the situation that we face in the area where we are now, which is we are, Lex the town of Lexington and our surrounding suburbs are um, on the outer fringes of the MBTA. So we get limited MBTA service. Our town also doesn't have any rail service, but we are surrounded by suburbs that have um, rail, commuter rail, regional rail. Um, and then in our area, we're also not served by any other RTA. Our closest RTA um, outside of the MBTA would be the Lowell Regional Transit Authority. So kind of when you get to our region, we're a little bit on our own with some MBTA service in there. And what's grown up with this situation is a variety of other transportation services. So we, for example, have a bus service called Lexpress. It's been operating since 1979. It is open to the public. It's very limited. It hasn't managed to, in all these years, it's just relied on three buses running every hour. Um, we have a taxi service that's for seniors. There's Council on Aging Services in Burlington. Burlington used to have a public bus service, much like Lexpress. It kept getting, the cuts kept getting, their budget kept getting cut to where they were down to one bus doing 12 routes. <laughs> um, and then in Bedford, um, they have a little public bus. It's, it's one route, but really it's more on demand where people just call the driver um, to have it come to them. And they did try something that's like a micro transit um, when we first started working with them, but that has since um, been eliminated. So that's kind of a sample of some of what we have in our area, mostly services that are primarily funded um, from the towns, um, maybe with some grants from other places. And then the challenge that we have is that there's just so many gaps, so many different eligibility processes for people. So there's been, there had been a variety of studies that have been done looking at transportation in the suburbs. I won't list all of them, but I will talk about a few of them that led up to this project of where we're at right now. Um, <clears throat> one was back, it came out in January of 2018. It was the Middlesex 3 Community Compact Study. And in that study, one of the recommendations was that the towns of Bedford, Burlington, and Lexington should um, look and see if they could combine their transportation resources to create a better connected coordinated system. So we did that. We did that through a process that we called Tritown Transit Study. Um, we had funding from the state, it was an efficiency and regionalization grant. And we looked to see what the three of us could do. And the challenge was, is that just combining our resources didn't give us a better service. We could make, create a more coordinated service, but we couldn't get you anything more than every, service every hour. We certainly couldn't get the coverage people were looking for because everything was pretty bare bones. So just combining it didn't make for a really great service. We spent a lot of time looking at um, the opportunities um, that could be available via micro transit. Um, at the time, it was really kind of suggested like, well, just get rid of fixed route service and just only have micro transit. We looked at that and the much higher cost and then also combined with our populations, um, it just presented some challenges. So we knew we couldn't just completely 
throw in the towel on any fixed route service and, and only rely on uh, you know demand type services. Um, so we knew we needed some new solutions. Um, it was a lot of great research. The other thing we realized though is that one of the biggest challenges is funding. You know, people really want to have more transportation services in these areas, including Lexington, but funding it is the biggest challenge. You know, it comes down to, well, but we have to pay for firemen and we have to pay for teachers and this and that. And so that's the challenge for us. So um, we have not given up completely. We went, <laughs> we approached uh, MassDOT for this community transit grant to see if we could just um, dig a little deeper, come up with some new approaches um, to help fill in the gaps. Um, and let me see. And I think at this point, I'm going to just kick it over to Lisbeth to kind of talk about the research process and, and where we are at this point in time. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Susan. I think, you know, I think Susan did a really good job of laying out the frustrations and the challenges, um, which are, can sometimes feel insurmountable. And so I think part of the, part of the basic foundation of the work that we've been trying to do with the town of Lexington um, as a team is to basically just commit to not stopping until we actually get something done, right? Um, doing studies is a lot easier than launching or running services. Um, just a lot easier. So we did a study. Uh, the story map link that you see up here is what I'm going to reference instead of using slides. Um, let's see. And I would like to try to share my screen if it'll let me. Yep. Um, there we go. So I, I'm intentionally sharing the online version of this rather than a separate slide presentation. We have a separate slide presentation, but we, and when we've used it, then people always email us and ask us like, where can we find more of this information? So I'd rather just show you the online version because then you can just go and find all the information there. Um, so this is essentially the study that we did is it's a public presentation of the study and, and where we are at now is trying to actually get the recommendations that we came to off the ground. Um, the basic big, Mass, sort of master recommendation <laughs> that we made um, is, is what we're calling the, the <laughs> macro vision, right? So this, this uh, diagram is kind of what we don't want. This is the opposite of the macro vision. This is lots and lots of redundant services being funded out of separate pots with separate eligible riders. Um, so that you know, all of the different members of your community, even if they live right next to each other, are eligible for completely different services at completely different quality levels, frequency levels, accessibility levels, right? You're, you're cutting up your community into having completely different transit experiences. And you know, whether or not that person happens to be transit dependent um, is not actually determining the quality of the service they're getting. Um, and also we're just creating, it creates lots and lots of redundancy. There's very good reasons for why all of these different services exist, right? Different populations do need, and different trip types do need different types of service. Um, but all of this redundancy, as we all know, is, is extremely financially inefficient and especially problematic in an environment where we have a limited number of vehicles and drivers. So this is kind of what we don't want. What we, what we are calling the macro vision for this is um, is really structured around really supporting fixed route service, right? Um, you know, we know that microtransit solves a lot of problems, but it's also very expensive. Um, you will never be able to serve the full range of your population if you're having to pay that much money per ride, right? Fixed route services, you know, in a higher capacity vehicle are the most efficient way to be able to serve the largest amount of your, the largest, you know, proportion of your population, therefore reserving as much money as possible for people who really need a specialized service, right? Um, and so what we really want is a fixed route core service that serves as much of the population at an at, puts as much of the population on equal playing field with an equal rider experience, right? Um, where they're, you know, everybody has equal access to an accessible, high frequency quality ride, and then trying to get all of the other services as much as possible to actually feed into that instead of replicating the service so that you don't have COA vans and TNCs, 
um, and everybody else replicating the exact same route on the exact same, you know, on the exact same uh, streets, getting in each other's way and also all paying on top of each other. Okay, so actualizing that, it sounds good. Actualizing that is a lot harder. Um, and that's, that is kind of in the step that we are right now. We made a number of other recommendations specifically, you know, as part of the study, uh, specifically directed towards small, um, other, other uh, you know, all the other types of transportation problems. Um, you know, those included that every municipality really needs better information sharing. Um, you know, we, we need uh, to pool and expand volunteer driver programs, um, which has been a hard one to tackle right at this moment because of the status of volunteer driver programs right now is kind of all over the place with being kind of still mid post, maybe eventually post pandemic. Um, you know, expanding the reach of existing demand response services, but not continuing to proliferate them. Um, which is a, you know, a huge challenge. So if you're, if you're really interested in demand response and you are trying to think of a good way to um, how to conceptualize it better, we, we put a lot of work into sort of breaking down different models for how you do demand response and how you can combine those services. So you, you can take a look at the link to the story map and go through those. Um, but like I said, the thing that we're really trying to work on right now is establishing a new kind of fixed route service. Um, I think, you know, the, the, but in an ideal world, right, um, the MBTA would be providing frequent and adequate service to all of the residents of the greater Boston area um, and, for, and beyond. Um, that isn't the situation that we have, we, and we don't unfortunately have, you know, control over what they do. Um, but what we, so what we would really like to do is build a service that is for everyone, <laughs> every member of the community, but especially is, is serving um, seniors and is serving those with paratransit needs uh, at a really, at, at the, and integrating them into the community instead of separating them out. Um, and so what we're working on right now is trying to build a pilot that will do that through utilizing private partners, community partners, um, basically trying to bring more people to the service that would serve seniors and para, uh, paratransit users um, instead of creating a separate service for them so that everybody is contributing to a single service. This has a lot to do with the operating model that 128 Business Council already uses, which is around pooling public and private partners, um, but really expanding who the potential pool of partners could be. Um, you know, some of the foundations that we want for this service um, I've already touched on a little bit, right? Like really a uniform rider experience, something that everybody, you know, has access to those accessible vehicles. It has consistent branding. Everybody knows where it is. And, you know, everybody knowing what that service is, is a huge point of importance for the pilot because the, the vision is that this would be something that could expand. This is something that could um, partners throughout the region would know what it was and members of the public could ask for it, right? Um, so they need to, it needs to be as recognizable as uh, Uber and Lyft, right? It needs to be, it needs to be um, a product that people can ask for. And a lot of that has to do with consistent branding. Um, accessible bus stops, you know, good unified rider tech down the road. What we would really like is for this to be unified rider tech. Um, that is also unified with the MBTA right now. The MBTA is not ready for that, um, but we are sort of ready to make that jump as soon as they are. That's a, that's sort of a priority for all of 128 Business Council services. Um, you know, unified dispatch um, and pro, you know, flexible protocols for partnering with with other modes. So, I think one of the things that um, once the, a fixed route fixed route is established for the pilot, really getting other partners, uh, other transportation providers of all sorts in the area to cooperate with that routing um, is going to be a huge challenge, but it's something that we're committed to doing, right, is coming up with ways um, to make it worth their time and effort to drop as many riders as possible onto the fixed route service instead of, instead of making that redundant trip like I talked about at the beginning. Um, and you really need incentives to do that. Um, and the incentives would vary by partner type. Um, and then an integrated system of marketing and practical incentives also for riders and partners. 
Um, you know, and this is something that we kind of, we already do on a lot of services that we run, but the, but the menu of what incentives can be has to be expanded a lot if you want to bring in a wider range of sort of non, um, you know, non-traditional business uh, private sector partners. So um, the route that we have been working on right now uh, trying to build partnerships around is a route that runs from Lexington um, up into Burlington. So the idea is to take some of the pressure off of Lexpress, which if you are, for those of you who are familiar with Lexpress, they are, the town is, is sort of doing heroic work trying to get their, all of their riders connected with all of the destinations that they want to reach, even ones that are outside of the town's borders. And obviously that's a huge financial lift for a single community to be doing. Um, so part of the goal for the pilot route is to take some of the pressure off of Lexington as our partner for getting people over town lines. Um, you know, we identified the town of Burlington as sort of the most critical community connection um, at this point. Um, so we've been working on trying to establish private sector and community partners in Burlington to do that. Um, so, and, and with the idea being that um, there would be kind of a central, a central hub in Burlington, um, connecting with major business points um, and uh, community destinations that then would be connected to a more accelerated route through Lexington all the way down into Cambridge. I'm kind of intentionally not zooming in on this because, I, <laughs> because the routing is dependent upon um, the establishment of those partners. And actually sort of at the end of the day, I think the most important thing for us is to get to get a new service like this on the ground, right? Part of our operating experience at the Business Council has been that it's a lot easier to, to expand pre-existing services than to start new ones. Starting new ones is always really, really hard. It's a really big lift to getting people to spend money that they're not already spending is hard, which is fair. I don't like spending money that I'm not already spending. So, you know, it's understandable. Um, getting new things is really hard is off the ground is really hard. Getting new partners to come on once somebody nearby is getting something that they aren't um, is somewhat easier, right? And so I think, you know, this is the route that we're currently working on. Um, I honestly can't tell you if this for sure, right? This is an active project. Um, it always makes me a little nervous even showing people something that is, you know, actively in the works. It might all fall apart. You know, I, we can't, you, everybody here works in this industry, you know that um, this stuff is hard. Right, but I think the, the biggest the biggest important thing right now is that we we want to get a pilot off the ground, um, and we're committed to continuing to work with the town until we can do that. Um, with the vision being that it would be not a pilot just for itself, right, but a pilot aimed towards expansion um, as a mechanism for so that there's an actual entity in the area that can take on. Um, the need for, for regionalized services. Cause right now, basically that entity doesn't exist. Um, so I think that's it. I've thrown a lot at you. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And I'm sure there's a lot of questions and objections, but uh, I'll stop talking now and open the floor up for, for questions. Yeah, thank you, Elizabeth and, and Susan. So please do, uh you know, raise your hands and we will call on you if you have any questions. And uh, also feel free to use the chat. I see Christine with a hand. Yeah, <clears throat> Lisbeth, is the goal to tap into the MBTA preferably for that pilot or the RTAs? So we would um, be wanting to make connections with both where applicable. The routing right now cuts between to and two currently underutilized MBTA routes that have very long on time, very long um, ride time, um, to the point that it's uh, that they are a tough sell if you want to try to say that there's equitable access to, you know, getting from Alewife up into Burlington. By MBTA, right? There are a couple of different routes that exist, but it, it's they're not the kind of routes that you can necessarily build a daily commute off of. Um, so the routing cuts between those rather than being redundant of them. 
um, and would meet up with uh, with MBTA service as a connection and and you know making sure that we are making connections with the T um, and with the RTAs as much as possible is obviously a priority. Um, although again, the, the frequency for those would be are both quite a bit lower than what we're aiming for uh, for this service. And were those two routes by any chance part of bus network redesign? Was that in the latest uh, not, <laughs> um, not necessarily in an improved fashion. Thanks. All right, so I see we have a question from Judy in the chat. Um, have you been successful in getting the participation of businesses, big employers, hospitals, the like? I mean, we're in active conversations right now, so that's kind of to be determined, right? We're, we're, we had several meetings last week. We have several more coming up. Um, so that's going to be sort of, that's an, that's an ongoing question. We'll report back. Yeah, one of the things that did come out of this, you know, so we were looking at all the potential places we would, all the places we would really like to connect to. Um, I would really like to make sure we head south, um, you know, that we can make some connections into Waltham um, and, uh, you know, maybe down even into um, Newton, Green Line and so forth. But um, the opportunities seem like at this point in time to get something going, there were more opportunities with Burlington and they happen to have a fairly excited uh, chamber of commerce that is um, uh, an economic development director who are um, really supportive of this project. Great. All right, Franny, I see you have your hand up. Hi, yeah, I'm sorry. I, since I missed the first half of the meeting, I apologize if I, I missed the answer to this, but in that kind of bus with a box program, there are two things that I um, wonder how you deal with. One is the um, parallel paratransit needs if you have a um, fixed route. I mean, how do you design it? So that does that. And the other is how are, how would it be funded? Like, um, yeah, what are the funding sources for that route? So folks who really need door-to-door um, -door transit, right? Um, obviously can't be served by a fixed route service. Um, the goal is to take as much pressure off of those door-to-door -door services as possible. So for folks who are kind of in the in-between category who need some help, but could get on the, an accessible vehicle, um, the goal would be to work with, um, you know, the pre-existing transit providers to connect them with this service. So we're taking some financial burden off of them also and, and driver hours, um, vehicle hours. Um, but obviously, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it can't replace, um, you know, fully, fully accessible door-to-door -door service. Your, your other question about funding. Um, right. So <laughs> part of it is, you know, long-term for a service to be really successful decades from now, right? The goal is to have um, funding be uh as grant neutral as possible, right? So you're not depending upon things that run out in a year or two, um, or that you aren't 100% sure are gonna be renewed long-term. Um, and, and, you know, most of the business council services, um, you know, at some level achieve that goal. So, you know, that that is sort of long-term what you want. Um, in the shorter term, you know, we are applying for all applicable, available, um, grant opportunities to take sort of the burden off of, to be able to get something on the on the road, right, um, that you can recruit more partners for. So, you know, you put together a total, you put together a total budget, divide up what, what partners would need, and then try to take the sting off of that as much as possible with what, with what grants are, are available out there. Um, you know, so the first partnership, um, push that we've been making over the last month has been oriented towards upcoming grant deadlines um, to be able to say, show that we have some matching funds to be eligible for those. Um, but in the long, long term, 
right? You don't want to be entirely dependent on that. Susan, did you have anything to add? Well, yeah, in a conversation with Elizabeth this morning, you know, I was saying um, as much as we are trying to take the burdens off of towns, uh, you know, I there's no way around it that towns, if they want to have better transportation services, are going to have to contribute. Lexington is in a challenging position right now, you know, from what I understand is we don't have a lot of money that we can just toss in to contribute to expanding transportation services. So I think we have to look a little bit differently. Those of you that have <laughs> been in this group for a while know that I think um, one of those opportunities to look at is um, the financial resources that we are contributing towards school bus service. It's when I look at it, I just, you know, trying to find any other source of funding if you all know other th other sources, please let me know. Um, I just think that's one route we have to go because if we create more public transportation services in our communities, you will get some youth to take them, which means you, in theory, should need less school-specific resources. And again, you're building more of a service that's open to the general public, less um, segregated services, which is ultimately the goal. Um, but then that frees up resources, right? So um, I think that's a place we really have to go. Um, I'm going to get busy working on the, the strategy and the messaging for that because that is obviously very um, challenging to convey to other people. I'm not even sure I've conveyed it all that well here in this past few seconds. I think we have time for one more question, if anybody has. All right, well, thank you, Elizabeth and Susan. This has been phenomenally interesting. I do look forward to hearing more about this project as it progresses. Uh, and thank you for coming out today to talk to us about it. We will definitely report back. All right, and if you oh, want to and I'll throw, sorry, I was just gonna say, I'll throw my email in the chat too, if anybody wants to reach out to me directly, because I do um, need to jump off. But if, they, if anybody has other thoughts that they'd like to contribute or questions, um, don't be shy. Thank you, that was about uh, exactly what I was about to suggest. So thank you again. Um, all right, so for our next presentation, I am excited to welcome back Ellie McCarthy, although I believe her title has changed since she last spoke to this group in October. Ellie is the manager of transit programs and analysis for the MassDOT Rail and Transit Division. In October, she told us about the framework for the RTA discretionary grant program. And now she's going to talk to us in more detail about some of the actual innovative ideas and projects that some of the regional transit authorities have been exploring with funding from that program. So as with the previous presentation, we'll have about 20 minutes for presentation followed by 10 minutes for Q&A. Uh, Ellie, go for it. Great, thanks so much, Sandy. Um, so as Sandy mentioned, I am the manager of transit programs and analysis. Uh, so I oversee the 5311 funding program, the RTA performance management program, and the RTA discretionary grant program, which is what we will discuss today. So if we go to the next slide, please, Stella. Thank you. So I've already presented this slide last time, so I'll, I'll very quickly go over it again, just in case you weren't there. Um, but basically, the RTA Discretionary Grant Program, it's a state-funded program specifically for RTAs. Um, it provides operating funds to allow RTAs to test innovative solutions to local mobility challenges. So more specifically, the program is providing targeted operating assistance, technology improvements, service evaluation, and program design for RTA projects that align with the recommendations from the 2019 RTA Task Force Report. Um, so the funding for this project is provided through outside sections in the Massachusetts state budget. So it's additional operating assistance to RTAs. Um, in FY19, we had 4 million. In fiscal 20 and 21, we had 3.5 million. Uh, unfortunately, there wasn't any funding in the current uh, fiscal 22 budget. Um, this is a competitive grant program, so the RTAs submit applications to MassDOT, 
And then the projects are chosen, projects that are chosen for award, um, the RTAs are required to enter into an MOU with MassDOT, which outlines the reporting requirements and performance indicators that the RTA and MassDOT will then use to gauge the success of the project. Um, so in my initial conversations with Sandy on, on which projects to present, he had mentioned that it'd be interesting to hear about projects that exhibited like good collaboration and cooperation with local partners. Um, so with that in mind, I have three projects to talk about today. All of these were conducted through the fiscal 20 grant round. Um, and I thought it would be a good idea to for folks on this call to hear about projects that were going on outside of the greater Boston metro area. So today we're going to discuss uh, a project from CCRTA on the Cape, from MART in the Lemonster Fitchburg area, and from PVTA in Springfield. Uh, next slide, please. So the first project we'll talk about is CCRTAs. Um, so funding was awarded for the enhancement of transit service in response to uh, rapid new development that was occurring in the Buzzards Bay community. Um, so this was a really nice TOD initiative where CCR today worked very, very closely with the Buzzards Bay community to increase and enhance service that was already available in that area, but to make it better and to be to respond to all of this new development that was occurring. Um, so to set the context for this project, for those who don't know, Buzzards Bay is one of seven villages that make up the town of Bourne. The Cape Cod, Cape Cod Canal runs through the town of Bourne and the majority of the community actually lives on the Cape side. Buzzards Bay is on the non-Cape side um, and it's a smaller village, but it does have a lot of activity on the main street, which is that red, um, red line highlighted in the map there in the corner. So the, this is primarily because a lot of local officials have worked really hard for the past two decades to attract new housing, new restaurants, hotels, senior housing. There's a lot of really attractive facilities, but in a very condensed area. And all of this work was done to revitalize that main street. And was initially intended to be transit oriented development for a, the, a new commuter rail station on the MBTA's Middleborough line. Um, but unfortunately, that hasn't materialized. So there is a train station that stops in Buzzards Bay. It's in the like the very end where that loop is. Um, and right now it's only serviced by the Cape Flyer, but this is a weekend summer passenger train. So there is very limited rail service at the moment. So basically what CCRTA did was they took this discretionary funding and capitalized on that transit development, transit oriented development opportunity, but for bus rather than for rail. So in September of 2020, they launched the Buzzards Bay Connector Service. This is a high frequency service corridor within the Buzzards Bay and Sagamore areas and was created from an overlap of two existing bus lines, the Sandwich Line and the Bourne Run. So essentially the Sandwich Line was extended from its previous terminus at the Sagamore Park and Ride to the Buzzards Bay train station, while the starting point of the Bourne Run was also extended further back to that station. So you have two routes kind of running concurrently next to each other. This doubled the frequencies of buses along that two mile stretch on Main Street between the train station and Belmont Circle, which is that other loop on the um, right hand side of the map. The extension of these two routes added service to Mass Maritime Academy, to a local market basket, the Bourne Scenic Park, the Bourne COA, the Bourne Town Hall, the Sagamore Parking Ride, and all of those newly developed residential and um, business developments. CCRTA also worked with GATRA for timed transfers between GATRA and CCRTA at the Buzzards Bay train station and a free transfer policy between the services for those who wish to make connections to Onset, Wareham, and uh, onward. Um, so I think one of the biggest 
the reason why this project was successful for CCRTA is they did a lot of extensive marketing initiatives to promote both the services. They had social media campaigns, they held a lot of stakeholder meetings, including a meeting with the Canal Region Chamber of Commerce. Um, and so they took feedback from all of that, all of those marketing initiatives and specifically those stakeholder meetings and provided continual service enhancements based on that input. So they continually tweaked the route over the course of that grant project in response to local feedback. You know, it would be great if it could hit this like just a little bit earlier. It'd be great if we could move the route just a little bit so it captures this area. They, they spent a lot of time with their stakeholder group, which consisted of local legislators, the board town manager, various select board members and other town officials, um, the Admiral of Mass Maritime, and then a bunch of local business leaders, like some of those restaurant owners, some of the people who did uh, a lot of the work with those housing developments. Um, they also created a link to a separate dedicated page on their website for the connector service. So it specifically called it out to their riders and, and made them aware that this was changing, this was updating, there was going to be two new buses, so you needed to make sure to like understand which bus you were taking and that it was clear and so they did a lot of um, posts on their so social media websites to do a like, big explaining of that. And in the future, they're planning on redesigning their website and still will have that dedicated page for the connector service and other Buzzards Bay transit enhancements. And they're planning on including interactive route maps, live bus tracking, simplified information and schedules to, have, to use like a more effective way of advertising for the route. Um, next slide, please. So, by the close of the grant, CCA, CCRTA had met and exceeded their outreach goals, reaching approximately 30,000 people through their various means of outreach. Um, I didn't include this information, but they were tracking things like social media interaction, the number of engagements, number of likes, number of shares, comments on their Facebook posts, and all of that mirrored the same trend that's shown in this outreach graph on the, the left side. Unfortunately, their ridership goal was not met. Um, the service was launched only like six -ish months after the initial days of the pandemic. Um, and so they were still experiencing a pretty substantial system wide ridership depression at that moment. Um, still, the ridership within that specific Buzzard Bay stretch, it did steadily increase month over month through the course of the project, as shown on this graph to the right side. Um, and last week, I actually spoke with CCRTA's administrator, Tom Kahir. I wanted to get his feelings on the project now that it had been closed out for about a year. And what he told me was that the Buzzards Bay based service stood out more than any of their other fixed routes in terms of return to ridership following the initial days of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, through their performance monitoring, ridership throughout the rest of the CCRTA fixed route was a little bit more stagnant and slower to return. Um, but they found that the Buzzards Bay ridership was it was returning a lot quicker than the rest of the system. And, and they found that to be very enlightening, very promising. And he attributed that a lot to the outreach that they did. All right, and so next slide, please. So next we'll talk about MART's COA Centralized Dispatch Project. So funding for this project was awarded for a coordinated dispatch program for COA centers in MART's region um, via a web-based system common dispatching application. So this project was an attempt to streamline and improve delivery of COA transportation services through shared resources while creating a centralized reporting system. Uh, Mark's plan was to create one single operational system that allowed for coordinated dispatch using one call center or portal, whatever it was that they decided uh, for ride booking that would be supported by one to two common dispatchers and a single pool of COA vehicles. 
Um, this system would be integrated into a single reporting system with a dashboard, and hopefully it would eliminate the need for COAs to submit individual monthly ridership statistics to MART. So MART worked with their technology vendor, HBSS, to create a dispatch application as a modification of the QRIDE software that was already in place within MART's operations and is the same software that was used to deploy their subscription microtransit service that was piloted through the FY19 grant round. Uh, the funds were also used to hire a mobility manager that, um, and his job was to design and launch the project to facilitate any outreach and coordination with the COAs. And then they also procured the UMass Boston Gerontology Department to conduct a study of the current structure of COA services and to help identify how best to centralize and promote ride sharing while still meeting the needs of seniors requiring transportation. So despite all of this outreach and analysis, um, Mark was only able to conduct the pilot for the coordinated dispatch system with four towns. Uh, I think it was Bolton, Lancaster, Shirley, and Sterling, I believe. Um, so as with CCRTA, and just, just because of the timing of when this project was going on, Mart was experiencing a lot of difficulties getting this project off the ground because of COVID-19. Uh, at this point in time, many of the COAs had suspended service or were in varying stages of reopening. Uh, there was a lot of staff turnover that was causing issues. You, it's hard to train when you're you know, you're training someone and then they leave and a new person comes in and, and they're still learning everything and now a new system on top of that. Um, so they, they struggled a lot with that. And there was also a lot of delays in um, adapting the QRIDE software to mirror the way that the COAs actually schedule their rides. So by the close of the pilot, only two COAs, I believe, it was Lancaster and Shirley, but I'll have to check, uh, formally elected to continue using the software for the ride dispatch portion. But Mark was still able to get all 15 towns to use the system for data reporting purposes. So they did find that to be a little bit of a win and easier for this, uh, the COAs to provide them data. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so there wasn't a lot of useful data that was collected for this project, so I don't have any graphs to show, um, but instead I reached out to Mark to see if they would be interested in providing any lessons learned that they felt would be relevant to share. Uh, so Mark kindly provided this comprehensive list here shown on the screen. Um, so starting with the design process, they feel it's very, very important to first begin with your end in mind. You really should be using the COA directors, the dispatchers, the call bookers, the drivers. They are the guide to determine what software should be chosen for something like this. Um, also, simplicity in that software is key and usability is key as because of COA staffing and resource limitations and the inherent uh, disadvantages to having to like retrain or just generally go down this Oh, did we lose our, uh, our presenter? All right, well, let's give uh... Give Ellie a minute to see if she can uh, recover and come back. And if not, uh, we'll skip ahead to some other material. In the meantime, if anybody has questions, please feel free to submit them in the chat and we'll get to them once uh, we do get Ellie back, assuming that we do. Well, while we're waiting, um, so would you like to skip ahead to the closing next steps slides? 
we can give people a little bit of information here while we're waiting for uh, for Ellie. Or actually, um, let's just do public comments now while we're waiting. Does it, anybody have anything that they would like to share generally uh, or to talk about? It's been a lot we, we've heard about today. You can also bring up kind of broader items if you'd like. Again, feel free to raise your hand or you can just uh, throw something in the chat. Oh, all right, nobody? Okay. Uh, all right, so Stella, let's go ahead to the, to the next step slides and we'll share information about our upcoming coffee chat. Um, so I do wanna share some information about what we're doing next as a working group. Uh, we're going to continue to hold these working group meetings quarterly, roughly, so you can expect one in August or September. Between now and then, uh, we will also be holding more of our series of coffee chats, which have been going phenomenally well, I think. Uh, these are informal virtual events centered on a particular theme or topic, and they're capped at about 30 attendees. Um, so I do have one to announce, which is also uh, shown on the slide, um, which is with Victoria Ireton, who I believe is here, um, who's the Deputy Director of Community Engagement with the MBTA, and she's going to be our guest on June 13th at 4 p.m. Victoria, do you want to say a few words? Just say hi and, uh, and talk about uh, what we're going to talk about in, in a couple of weeks. Be happy to. Hi, everyone. Very nice to meet the group. Excited to join the coffee chat and uh, really just focus to talk about how the MBTA is moving from project-based outreach to more relationship-based outreach and kind of my role and taking feedback and all that stuff. So look forward to, to meeting with the group. Excellent. Very excited for this. And again, that's at 4 p.m. on Monday, June 13th. And I'm going to put the registration link uh, to the upcoming coffee chat in the chat. All right. Um, and Ellie says she lost internet and is rebooting. So I think we can expect her back in one minute. Anybody else have anything they'd like to discuss? Questions? No? All right. Well, we'll just give uh, Ellie another couple minutes. I wish we could put on some music or something. <laughs> Stella, do you want to take us back to the uh, to the slide where we lost Ellie? Sandy, if you are still waiting for Ellie, I, I do have a question. Um, you referenced, or someone referenced, the six uh, new MPO funded shuttle microtransit projects. Do yes. You know, could you say what those are? Um, let me see if we have them listed somewhere. And if one of my colleagues wants to see if we can find that quickly, the best way to, to get a list is going to be to look at, uh, it's going to be to get in touch with Matt, although we may have a list somewhere. Probably was posted at the last MPO meeting, but I don't have it off the top of my head. Um, so I saw it. Susan, I'll get back to you on that in a moment. Um, Travis, did I see you had a hand up? Well, yeah. First of all, can you hear me? Yes. I guess, yeah, I guess it was a question more for the, on this presentation with Mart and the centralized dispatch. I guess the, the point, I think it's the next slide, um, about senior rights differing from the general public rights need. I guess it's sort of interesting that, that I guess maybe this is a question more for the She's not back yet, but, um, you know, the senior, right, I think that that's interesting, you know, that like there, that can be, it was difficult to kind of make that this coordinated service and that the scene, the senior rights is, is different because I guess what I just, I'm, it's just in any other state, it would be a lot of this stuff would be done like on the county level, you know, we wouldn't have individual COAs and things. And I'm just I'm sort of curious as to, you know, what is the kind of the, I guess, things that are hindering maybe some of this better coordinated, even senior transportation. And then I guess I was just more curious on that. I guess if, if others, I guess I'm sort of thinking of 
coordinating this this service can be difficult. I'm sort of thinking of you know how we we're all looking to coordinate or even better you know uh, maybe even consolidate these services. But just as curious if anyone else had a thought on that. Yeah, we've had some interesting discussions about that in some of our coffee chats, uh, especially the human services transportation ones, especially. Um, but it is a real challenge, especially as you said, Travis, without that uh, county level of government uh, here. So I don't know if anybody else wants to chime in on that. Um, and I see Christine asked in the chat if MPO is coordinating all with MBTI and commuter rail vision next steps. Um, yes, we're in touch with them. Uh, I, I think we're doing some modeling work uh, for the MBTA on certain projects, including, I don't know if we have anything active on rail vision right now, but um, we have done some modeling for them on that in the past. Um, and I'm in touch personally with the uh, manager of that program. So we have had updates here at the transit working group on that in the past. And if there's interest, we can definitely try and get Alistair in for an, an update uh, on that in the at a future meeting. Uh, yeah, John. I managed one you how lucky. Thanks very much, Sandy. Uh, I had just had a, a question, a general question for all of this, the people that made presentations today. And that question is on the vehicles that are going to be used on all these different routes. Are there going to be provisions for packages? So that anybody that wants to, because if you have uh, seniors like myself or other people uh, going to market basket, that means bags of stuff. So I'm just uh, curious is that if they're going to be on the vehicles, certain areas, designated areas or whatever for packages. All right. So I think we have Ellie back and John, we'll get to that question. Ellie, are you here? I am. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that is all right. We managed to fill the time. Um, so I think we will, I know there were a lot of questions that have been brought up. Let's put that back to the end and let's let Ellie finish her presentation and then we can ask her questions directly uh, as, soon, as long as her computer is now behaving. I do apologize. It was my internet. I unfortunately live in a somewhat rural area. There are two options to choose from and they both suck. So my, my sincere apologies. All right. Um, let me get myself collected here for a second. Um, I think I was sort of in the middle of this slide. Now I'll get my notes back up. Okay. So, all right. So it's important to also understand um, the needs of the customer and to make sure what you're creating takes into account how senior ride needs uh, differ from the general public rides needs. Um, this includes considerations such as trip chaining, longer boarding times, door to door and door through door service, wellness checking and common trip destinations. So this should all be a part, considered as part of the dispatching considerations. Um, so it's a good idea to include older adult focus groups in designing any sort of sub-regional ride sharing concept to help understand and put seniors rides needs first. It also kind of helps with the easing and understanding of seniors' concerns with using a new system, a new type of ride share that historically may not have always been the most like trustworthy or, or easier way of getting around. So um, it's important that the vehicles used for these services are accessible, are designed for older adults to help get over those perceptions of a rideshare vehicle being uncomfortable, unsafe, difficult to board, whatever it may be. Um, so travel training and buddy systems are definitely highly, come highly recommended from Mart. They did go down that road of trying to get those first time older riders um, getting them comfortable using the service and understanding that like it may not be their COA van, but it is still a COA van that will get them to where they need to go. Um, so uh, next slide, please. All right, the last project we'll talk about is PVTA's Valley Pass pilot program. 
Um, so funds for this project were awarded for the development of a proprietary software customization uh, through ByteMark for a universal fare payment platform. Uh, ByteMark currently hosts the Mass.Bus Plus app. So PVTA and Mass.Bus work together with ByteMark to develop a mobile fare payment platform through that venue. Um, so PVTA took advantage of ByteMark's business partnership module, which allows you to bring on different local agencies, businesses, so that they can pre-purchase or so bulk purchase um, fare media. So the award also included 125,000 in subsidized fares for the Valley Pass program, which was an incentivized discount program to, uh, to provide support um, to businesses, employment centers, and human service agencies, and allowing them to offset the cost of commuting for essential workers, for job seekers, and for low-income workers. So the mobile fare payment application was launched in July of 2020. Um, so all of PVTA's fare media is available for purchase through the app, and it's shown on the right-hand side of the screen here, kind of what that looks like on your phone. Um, and using the business partnership module, PBTA was also able to enroll students from Holyoke Community College and the Springfield Technical Community College into a discounted fair pass program. And they also collaborated with 15 local agencies for the electric, electronic distribution of those Valley passes to their workforce or their clients. So again, those essential workers, those job seekers and low income workers. Next slide, please. Uh, so this project was very successful in terms of the performance goals that PVTA had identified through the MOU process. Um, over the 15 months, PVTA sold a cumulative number of around 150,000 passes through the application. And this was during those early days of the COVID-19 pandemic. So the introduction of a mobile fare payment option was very well received by customers that were concerned with the current public health crisis. Um, so of those 150,000 passes, approximately like 23,000 were used by those Valley Pass workforce participants. And so that's that middle graph. Um, the last graph to the right, this simply illustrates that there was some delay in enrolling some of those local employers into the program. Again, mostly attributed to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, while the app was launched in July, it wasn't until September that PVTA was able to bring a local employer on board through that business partnership module, and then not until December that the program really kicked off. But still, by the end of the, by the close of the project, PVTA had exceeded their goal of 10 employers and enrolled a total of 17. Uh, examples of these employers and other agencies enrolled include Big Y Foods, Springfield Partner for Community Action, the City of Springfield's Youth and Young Adult Homeless Program, the Western Mass Hospital, and the Springfield City Library. So based on feedback received from PVTA, um, the Valley Pass program has continued to be successful beyond the life of the grant um, with continued increases in ridership from past users, uh, particularly from their educational partners. So aside from some of the community colleges and technical schools that PVTA has worked with, they're also currently working with the Springfield and Holyoke High Schools to enroll them in the program as well. Uh, technically, these aren't new partners for PVTA. They do already purchase uh, PVTA paper passes for their students, but they are now planning to transition into the app because it allows them for a little bit more flexibility in administrating, distributing, changing pass types for students and that type of thing. Um, so with that, that is all that I had to present. So if um, I know there were some questions that popped up, so happy to answer those as best I can. Yeah, thank you, Ali. Very, very interesting stuff. Uh, so please, people, feel free to uh, raise your hand if you have questions, put them in the chat. I know that Susan had a question earlier about the frequency of the CCRTA route on Main Street in Buzzards Bay. Um, do you know what the combined frequency is of buses on that, that street? I believe it's 30 minutes. 
Um, so each route is an hour, but it's alternating so that there's a bus every 30 minutes. Excellent, thank you. Um, and John asked whether the bullet point that says transit authorities need to use their own vehicles, does that mean people using their own personal cars? I assume that means vehicles belonging to each agency. Yeah, agency vehicles is what they were referring to. Um, it's a little bit, I, I think in my discussions with Mark, they got concerned, you know, if it wasn't specifically their COA's vehicle or it didn't say like Mart on it or something like that, it, it, they would have felt a little bit more comfortable if it did say Mart on it so that they knew it was coming from like the overarching COA dispatch program. It was still running through that whole process that they're familiar with, but even if the driver and the vehicle wasn't what they were familiar with. Um, and so having the RTA actually provide the vehicle, the accessible vehicle would be helpful because it eases a little bit of that concern. Very interesting, yeah, thanks. All right, any other questions? All right, and Ellie's contact information is on the slide and Ellie, if you could throw it in the chat as well, that would be fantastic. Absolutely. All right, so I know we did a little bit. Thank you, very interesting. Uh, always great to have you, Ellie. And uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll see you again more in the future. Um, so I know we did a little bit of a public comment period while we were missing Ellie, um, but if we want to uh, give folks another opportunity, since we have a few minutes left, anything, any questions, anything folks would like to bring up? All right, John. John, you are muted. Probably for good reasons. Uh, it, what I wanted to ask Sandy again was if there are any provisions for packages on the vehicles that are going to be proposed for all these different routes, especially for seniors going to market basket. Uh, I would imagine that there are various folks here who might have more insight on that than I do. I think in general, most of the vehicles have some provisions for that. Susan, maybe do, you, do, do the Express vehicles have good provisions for packages? Um, thanks, yeah, so I was gonna respond to, to that. We um, don't have as much room as I would like. We let people come on with their um, shopping carts, but it is really challenging. One, for shopping carts to go upstairs. That's one challenge. We currently have three stairs. The other is our aisles are narrow and just the seating space is rather narrow. So my dream vehicles would be low floor. They would have wider aisles um, and it would just be easier to keep your shopping cart with you. I. Um, we do have room in the back of our bus where if, if necessary, if all your stuff can't fit with you right in your seat, you could take it to the back. I will say that just becomes a little bit challenging um, to do that for a variety of reasons. So I think if, if there, <laughs> but so it would be nice if there were just more room in general. I think the challenge is what's currently available. I, with some of these, um, with some providers, they're getting their vehicles through the state contract. Um, and so it really kind of depends what's available there. And then just in general, um, what makers have available. If you give up room for packages, you lose some room for seats and, and so on. But I, I do think we need more room for that. Um, and I had raised my hand too, because it was to respond to Travis's question, which now I'm not sure I remember it exactly. Correct me if I'm wrong, Travis. Um, maybe you should just restate it. Yeah, I guess I'm not really sure. I, I, I can't, I mean, there were a couple of things I was trying to ask there, but one is that, you know, I think sometimes the, the senior transportation uh, can be really different. So I'm sort of thinking of like, you know, the way how we can, can we, can we find ways to combine services so that we don't have the overlapping, but sometimes I think, I think everyone knows here, but you know, maybe we need to, others need to remember that, that sometimes we have those trips can be very different. You know, someone needing the door to door service um, is, and you know, maybe the door through service that was on the slide there is, is really different from someone getting to work which is someone getting to the grocery store that was just talked about with John's question. So sometimes these, you know, we, there's, we have different services and for a very good reason. And I think that that's just something that uh, 
need to remember at times. And I, I think that was, that was sort of my, my comment. Yeah. And, and I, yeah, so I know for us, like through this whole regionalization process, we were definitely looking at that. Like, is there a way we could get all the, the COAs and all those services to come together? Was there a way we could kind of, you know, obviously get them more coordinated and maybe even like reduce providers, you know, consolidate a little bit more and, and would that work? Um, what I, I think the challenge that I see is that a lot of times the way those are operated and who's operating them, you have people that are very focused on that particular job in front of them, which is to book the rides for people. And so stepping out and doing something like this, focusing on this larger um, sort of planning process is not something that's normally a part of their job. I think that's, that's one thing that makes it a little bit challenging and just that everybody does have their own chain of command they have to go through. I, I think that's another challenge. In terms of the different trip types, so I still think there's opportunity, like with what Elizabeth was showing, like I found just to give a couple examples, like we have um, a COA, uh, a neighboring COA, uh, Belmont, for example, they struggle to get their people all the way up to Leahy and Burlington, for example. So we've tried to work with them to say, look, if you could at least get your people to us, you know, our Express bus service, we go to Leahy Burlington, we could take them the rest of the way. And, um, but since that's a very different way for COAs to kind of operate, I think when you have people, granted, there's some people that making a transfer like that may be a little challenging, but that's where I think for folks like that, where they can't do that, then that's where you have your paratransit or your other services. So as much as possible, if we could get more people um, to utilize more of the fixed services, if you will, even if they can't go all the way, you know, connecting it to them, I think it opens up more opportunities and then hopefully also reserves more resources for the people that need more curb to curb, door to door services. The door through door is challenging. Like none of us provide door through door services. Um, so, um, but yeah, I hope I answered your question. <laughs> all right. No, you right. Did. Thanks. Yeah. Great discussion. Thank you. Thanks, both of you. So we're going to say that it is 2.28. Um, John, did you have something else you wanted to say? Uh, I, I just wanted to say that um, in terms of uh, attracting, everybody uh, had mentioned a lot about the outreach and so forth. If you get the outreach and then the person comes to the bus, uh, what I was thinking of is the model that you see when you go to Logan Airport and you take the, uh, the buses there to the subway, those little uh, transit buses, and they have a little section in the middle you can throw your suitcase on. This is attractive and uh, people uh, you know, that are in charge of the uh, procurement and so forth, uh, we've heard from some of them here today, uh, you know, kind of bear that in mind. I think that'll make a big difference and that's also something that can be advertised on the websites, et cetera. So thank you. Thank you for bringing that up, John. Very, yeah, very interesting. All right, uh, so let's run through the ending slides one more time. Let's do this, trying in a more organized fashion. Um, so thank you again to Ellie, to uh, Elizabeth, and to Susan, to all of our presenters, everybody who's participated today. Um, next slide. I'm just going to throw the registration link to the uh, next coffee chat in the uh, chat one more time. Um, next slide. So following up on this meeting, we'll be sending out a post-event uh, email, includes information about various topics mentioned today links to the recording of the meeting, posting of the slides, and uh, various links shared during the meeting today. I'll try and get that done by the end of the week, the week and then I'll send out the registration link for that coffee chat uh, again. Next slide, please. And just finally, if anyone has any questions, ideas, or thoughts uh, they'd like to share, we're showing your contact information on the slide uh, for myself and for Stella. You can always reach out to me at S Johnston, S J O H N S J O H N S T O N at ctps.org or 857-702-3710 uh, or Stella S Jordan at ctps.org 857-702-3675. Um, this has been a great conversation. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, and thank you again uh, to uh, everybody who participated. Yes, I had questions about the microtransit 
uh, projects through the Community Connections Program, you should talk to Matt Genova, M-G-E-N-O-V-A, at ctps.org, our tip manager. Um, and if you need that contact information, uh, please feel free to reach out to me and I will put you in touch. He will have all the information. Unfortunately, we don't have a handy list of those projects at the ready. Um, so have a great afternoon, everybody. Thanks for sticking with us. Take care. <laughs>